and about the event. Just be, just be. If the crew of an alien craft were looking for the least promising human to share an encounter with that day, Bob Taylor would have been high on their list. Now 86, there's been no room for nonsense or wild imaginings in his life. Born in rural Perthshire, Bob Taylor worked as a gardener until the outbreak of war in 1939, when he joined the Fife and Forfarshire Yeomanry as a tank driver. We went up through uh, France to Belgium and the Netherlands, and, uh, and then uh, that was the the start of the Dunkirk evacuations. So I'm afraid we got chased out there. I was a tank driver. The tank driving is, is not much different from driving a big lorry, but you can keep the heat. Bob was given a return ticket as part of the invasion of Europe in 1944. DD plus five when I went out and uh, fought my way right up through France and Belgium. Eventually, uh, when the war finished, we was at Hamburg. After the war, with a minimum of fuss, Bob returned home to work as a roadman, and in 1964 he applied to work at Livingston Newtown. The new town was being built in the heart of West Lothian, barely 20 miles from Edinburgh. Even a new town needed forestry workers, and Bob joined up. It wasn't a, a commercial forestry, it was just private for the town. I've never really lived in a town until this Livingston. I was there when the first house was put up. 1964, and I watched it being built. The town of Livingston grew, but the efforts of the forestry workers remained generally unremarked until that morning in 1979. I was a foreman forester, you see, and <coughs> in Livingston, although it was a big town, it still had big pastures with sheep, and so we had to, uh, that was my job first thing, to see that the gates were Closes. And that day, I was just walking down the, between the plants, the trees, and the, turned a corner, and there was this huge vehicle just sat there in front. I just stared at it for a while. It was immense. And then I noticed that it was two uh, objects dropped down from it and made towards me. There were, there were two round balls and they, were, they weren't walking, they were going on spikes. They came towards me on spikes and uh, they both landed up beside me and gripped me and it actually tore my trousers and uh, just passed out. And then I tried to go home and I couldn't walk. I crawled 100 yards at least. I had a bed for fun. And I got into the van and I couldn't drive it. I reversed it right into a ditch. And then I had to walk home. I couldn't drive my bed for... My wife was wondering what on earth would come over because I was all dirty. And I told her I'd been attacked. Mm -hmm. So she sent for my boss, Mr. Drummond, and uh, he came up to see what was going on. And I told him, well, he says, well, I'll get uh, another workman and we'll go up and see if there's any traces of it. And of course, they found the traces of it where it had landed. Bob's wife also called the family doctor. Well, that morning I was doing the house calls for that part of Livingston 
and we received a call at the surgery from his wife saying that this patient had been uh, attacked by a flying saucer and could we make a house call. So I arranged to do that and I went up to the house to see him. And how was he? Well, he was um, rather agitated and distressed, but he was able to give me quite a reasonable story about what had happened. I did a complete routine examination uh, of the vital signs, heart and blood pressure, temperature, and lungs and abdomen, and there was no, no uh, basic uh, physical abnormality to be found. The only thing we could find were two marks, abrasions on his legs, one at each side, where his trousers had been torn. And the whole thing did need investigating properly from a medical point of view. Even in 1979, hospital waiting times could be tiresome. Bangaur Hospital is now derelict, but Bob's reluctance to wait could have been encouraged by the view from the hospital window. The dip on the tree line marks the spot where, Dunkirk and Normandy aside, he'd probably had the most scaring experience of his life. Might his visitors still be out there looking for him? In the meantime, Bob's manager had also had the presence of mind to call the police. Detective Constable Ian Wark, based in Bathgate, was called to the scene. The officer who led this inquiry was uh, the divisional commander, uh, Chief Superintendent David Scott. Now, he was first told of the incident by uh, Livingston Development Corporation, who were the uh, employers of uh, Mr. Taylor. Now, Mr. Scott, like most of us, just found it very, very hard to believe that uh, this UFO had landed in Deckman Law that morning. and. Uh, he took the approach that Mr. Taylor had been assaulted and therefore we would carry out an investigation into his claim of being assaulted and that's the route we actually took. An assault calls for a scene of crime examination and that was Ian Wark's task. First of all, when I arrived, the, the area had been fenced off by Livingston Development Corporation to prevent anybody uh, disturbing any evidence but I had a good look around and I saw marks on the ground, numerous circles, approximately three, three and a quarter inches in diameter, and marks quite similar to uh, caterpillar tracks. Uh, I then made a sketch plan. I also took some photographs, but this, the sketch plan proved to be a great piece of evidence. Later that day, we actually went down to Livingston Development Corporation uh, offices where they keep their machinery. Because, to be quite honest, I thought we could solve this there and then by just examining the, 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 the marks on the ground with their machinery. But after examining every piece of machinery that they had up there, we didn't find anything to match. What particularly intrigued Detective Constable Ian Wark was that the unusual marks on the ground were only to be found in the clearing itself. These marks just arrived. They didn't come from anywhere and didn't go anywhere. They just arrived as though somebody had, like a helicopter had just landed uh, or something had landed from the sky. De definitely didn't lead to anywhere and definitely didn't go anywhere. The job of protecting the scene became much more difficult after the news got out. It can't be denied an apparent alien abduction was news. The, the following day, the, actual, the snow fell on the site, but there were hundreds of people who came up there the following that day weekend, and most of them took away a part of the, the soil, the dirt, the grass, whatever they could get their hands on, they took it away. And obviously, over that weekend as well, it obviously caught the national press, uh, television, uh, everybody was up filming. It was obviously quite a, a major story. And among the first to put himself into the picture at the scene was a young UFO investigator, Malcolm Robinson. At that time, I was a young ufologist. I was ever keen to learn more about the fascinating mysteries of this subject. And immediately I contacted the newspaper, got some details from the press reporter, and managed to take myself and a colleague. We went over to Dean's near Livingston to speak with uh, Robert Taylor. 
and we then went to visit the location where this incident had occurred. We saw that uh, the police had fenced off the area. Um, some colleagues of mine from another society had brushed away the snow and you could clearly see the indentations in the grass, which we have photographs of, of the society. We have photographs of triangular ind indentations, circular indentations and track-like marks which were left on the grass. It's hard to believe it's 25 years, Stevie. Eh? The place has changed so much, the uh -huh. trees are so much taller. Uh -huh. So what did happen to Bob Taylor that day in 1979? Did he encounter an alien spacecraft in a forest in West Lothian? Did someone or something attack him? Stephen Knox and Stuart MacDonald were work colleagues at the time. I can uh, still remember how surprised I was at the time that Bob had came out with a story like that because uh -huh. <laughs> the type of person he was. Well, he wasn't a man that, that, that made things up. He was oh. a very quiet man. And this would have been the first sight he got as he came round the corner yeah, here, yeah. into the clearing. The clearing is now half the size it was then, but in 1979 it was a hive of activity. Not just the police and media, it was also a magnet for UFO investigators. Some of the investigators were anxious to believe. Others, like Stuart Campbell, were incredulous. It was a member of the press who called me about that, telling me that an incident had occurred at Livingston. I was dumbfounded at the time, especially when he told me that there had been a robot or some uh, aliens had emerged from an object and frightened somebody. Uh, but I obviously had to continue with the investigation of that uh, event. The first possibility to be considered was that it was all a big hoax. Bob Taylor was having everybody on. Everyone agreed that Robert Taylor was a very reliable witness. Even the police, I was glad they were involved in this, they also confirmed that they could find no evidence that Robert Taylor was the sort of person who would make up a story. In fact, he was the last person in, in Livingston Development Corporation anyone would think would make up a story. I concluded that he was just a phlegmatic forester and incapable of making up this story. We had to believe that he saw something or that we had to believe that he was honestly reporting what he thought happened. So it wasn't a question of finding uh, anything wrong with his story. It was a question of finding out what possibly could have caused him to have this experience. I came to the conclusion that in the three interviews that we did with him, he never changed his mind. He stick, st stuck to his story. He uh, was adamant that what he was telling us is what he saw. Uh, we had marks on the ground, his trousers were torn, we set them for forensic examination. Bob Taylor's trousers and long johns were sent to Lothian and Borders Police Forensic Science Laboratory in Edinburgh. Biologist Lester Nibb conducted the examination. There was a bit of, um, as I recall, mud and, and material that fitted with his story of being out in the woods on that particular day. But obviously the main interest was the damage on each of the hips. Um, now the damage was not particularly similar on each side but there were similar uh, facets to it and the particular one that I noted was that the tears went upwards uh, from the bottom. Quite often if it's tearing to clothing it will be sideways or downwards. In each case you have uh, a tear up there uh, and tears up there. That Both tears were were quite ragged uh, along the edges. So although they were different in, in dimensions, they were, they were probably caused in a similar kind of way. It seemed to be caused by a mechanical type of action. Um, in other words, something um, hooking on or grabbing the, the trousers and breaking the fabric and moving up with it. Interestingly, there were uh, a set of uh, long johns with this and the, the damage had extended through to the lower layer. A sceptical view is that these tears to Bob Taylor's trousers could have happened while he was struggling away from the scene, snagged on barbed wire for example. I, I probably would think not uh, for a variety of reasons. One is that most of barbed wire has multiple points at a single locus on the, on the wire and you might expect um, that to be reflected in the damage at, at each of these points. So barbed wire probably wouldn't rate 
as, as one of the choices for causing the damage. Of course, forensic science has developed dramatically since 1979. DNA profiling has emerged and would surely provide some interesting new information. I think probably not because of the length of time that it's taken uh, since the incident and the number of people who've handled this in the meantime. Uh, most people would have poked in the damaged area and there'll be DNA from a large number of people um, around that area. Trying to pick the uh, individual, the original individual, if there was one, uh, out of all of those will be next to impossible. So nothing actually emerged from the lab examination of the trousers to shake Bob Taylor's story. That's not the same as confirming it, although that hasn't restrained their present keeper, ufologist Malcolm Robinson, from taking the trousers to the people as if they did. The trousers have been in my possession now for around about 25 years and in that time I have taken them to various venues here in the United Kingdom on tours, on lecture tours from uh, you know, uh, schools, colleges, all over the place where I regularly talk about this fantastic case and show the physical evidence, the physical evidence to go with this case. UFO sceptic Stuart Campbell doesn't think the trousers prove anything. And how do we know the trousers weren't torn before the event? A pair of torn trousers is not exactly evidence that he was attacked by robot, uh, robotic aliens. In any case, Stuart Campbell has the rest of the so-called physical evidence in his sights. The mysterious tracks found at the site. I wasn't sure what to make of them, but I did recognise some of the marks uh, as those made by grass when it grows around objects lying in the grass. As an architect, I'd seen this very many times. In fact, most people will have seen it. If you, if you leave a plank or something in grass, the grass will grow around it. And if you remove it, you've left a pattern, a mold of this, this shape in the grass. This looked to me like that. And I was a bit skeptical that any craft had landed in this clearing. What about the three inch diameter holes in the ground? I was able later to conclude that these looked like the marks you get when the pick is, is, is heaved into the ground. And why would anybody put a pick in? Well, to get the planks and wood out that have been trapped there, lying there for some time. So there was a reasonable um, mechanical building construction explanation for these marks, which I was sure had nothing to do with whatever Robert Taylor had seen. Hello, Hello, gentlemen. Nice Hello, to yeah. see you again. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Doing? You'll notice some changes here since the last time you're here. Yes, I'm amazed how small it looks now. Yeah, it's really the trees have grown so much they've came in quite a bit. Stuart Campbell's dismissal relies on his belief that labourers at the reservoir works a quarter of a mile away illegally stored pipes in the clearing and then lied about it to cover themselves. But Stuart MacDonald and Ian Wark don't think that proposition stands scrutiny. Well, I certainly can't recall pipes being stored here. I couldn't categorically say that they weren't stored here, but I've no recollection of that. And what I would say, though, is the marks on the ground weren't consistent with uh, pipes having been laid there. There were smaller marks and, and quite precise marks and uh, not consistent with pipes having been laid in the ground. I would say that uh, on the morning uh, I examined the site here, the vegetation was green. And I believe that if pipes had been lying on the ground for any length of time, it would have turned the vegetation into a yellow colour. So I would definitely say no, these marks were definitely not made by pipes. What about the circular holes left by Stuart Campbell's pickaxes, levering up illicitly stacked water pipes? The diameter of these uh, holes in the ground were approximately three inches. Uh, they would have to be really, really big picks, and they were all going in at the same angle, right round these tracks, which we first of all thought were caterpillar tracks. Stuart Campbell's scepticism is based on the fact that we can't know for sure that the tracks at the site and the damage to Bob Taylor's trousers and long johns weren't present before he apparently stumbled across the alien spacecraft. Neither can Stuart Campbell prove that they were. But his main target isn't the physical evidence at all, but Bob Taylor himself and his loss of consciousness. He was out for 20 minutes. He also complained of some, he had some peculiar symptoms. A strong odour that he experienced, very acrid odour. He lost his voice uh, after he came round, after the end 20 minutes. He couldn't stand, he had paralysis in his legs, his mouth was dry and he had a headache. 
the medical person I consulted, my medical colleague, was quite satisfied that the whole experience was explained as an epileptic fit. Something had happened spontaneously to him. However, he was prone to it due to his previous meningitis. He was predisposed to have a fit. Uh, and if he had not had meningitis, this wouldn't have happened to him. Had you ever had a fit before? Never. No. Have you had a fit since? Not at all. Mm. One would have expected more than one attack, certainly. And if the meningitis was, was it nine years previously? Uh, there would have been surely to have been attacks of trouble between the, in the nine years between the, the original meningitis and this event which occurred. Today, Bob Taylor is happy for his family doctor to confirm the absence of any fits. Yet Stuart Campbell seems driven to explain how Bob got what happened to him so very wrong. I was looking at a lot of other UFO reports, uh, mainly from other parts of the world, and I was finding that in most cases I, I could find an astronomical object, usually a, one of the bright planets, a naked eye planets, or a very bright star, that was just where the observer said they saw something. In desperation, one day, I decided to see if it had any relevance to the Livingston event. And I was most surprised to find that there was indeed a very bright object near the horizon in Robert Taylor's line of sight. In fact, in the direction which he was looking. And that object was Venus, the brightest planet that you can see. Stuart Campbell not only proposes that Bob Taylor had an epileptic fit, but also specifically asserts that the fit was brought on by a shimmering and dramatically enlarged image of Venus, which he describes as an astronomical mirage. You'll have all seen um, an inferior mirage on a hot road in summer. Look, it's not looking like water on the road, it's actually the sky reflected. And that's an important aspect because mirages do, re do involve reflections. Um, but not many people know that you get reflections in the sky. They're called superior mirages. Stuart Campbell argues that a reflective layer can form in the atmosphere as a result of temperature inversion, warm air above colder air. This reflective layer acts like a mirror or lens, magnifying an astronomical image, in this case Venus, and then reflecting it to the ground. When it's an astronomical object, this is what I call the AMH, because the object in, in question turns out to be an astronomical object, with, which is probably very low on the horizon. It can even be below the horizon, but you're seeing it because it's being refracted and reflected through the atmosphere around the Earth. Stuart Campbell acknowledges that the astronomical mirage hypothesis is his own brainchild not yet in the textbooks. The Glasgow Science Centre at Pacific Quay has a planetarium which aims to engage people with the excitement of deep space. We wondered if the astronomical mirage hypothesis would stand up to scrutiny by visiting astronomer Terry Mosley and planetarium scientist Mario Di Maggio. Hi Mario, good to see you. Yes, do you come in. Thanks very much. Right, so Terry, here we have the position of the Sun, Venus and Mercury as seen from Livingston by Bob Taylor in 1979. Yes, that's correct. Those positions are absolutely right. Uh, the difference is, of course, that what he saw was the real sky, which was very, very much more bright. And in fact, Venus would simply not have been visible. It's too faint and too low down and you have a bright sun in the sky and it would not have been visible under those circumstances. Terry Mosley has grave doubts. First, that Venus was in a position to generate much light at all that morning in November 1979. Well, Venus is actually, in theory, visible in daylight, but only when it's at maximum brightness, only when it's high up in the sky, and only when it's at its maximum elongation distance from the sun. And that did not apply in this case. It was low down, it was less than half its normal brightness, and it was quite close to the sun. So that would make it, in my view, almost impossible, if not totally impossible, to see it simply because of the brightness of the daylight sky. The sun would have been 6.3 billion times brighter than Venus. 
So you simply do not see Venus in the daytime sky in those conditions. But even if Venus had been in the right place at the right time, Terry Mosley doesn't care much for the astronomical mirage hypothesis itself. I think the, the atmospheric conditions that could give rise to that are so remote as to be to all intents and purposes impossible. It would require basically a gigantic lens in the sky at approximately the right time and the right place and that just has never happened. I have never heard of any phenomenon being reported anything like that. The council put up a plaque to mark the site of Bob Taylor's experience. The plaque was stolen so often, they stopped replacing it. The idea of an alien craft landing in West Lothian is certainly challenging. But is the alternative explanation any easier to swallow? An astronomical mirage phenomenon that has never been observed, which induced a once-in-a-lifetime epileptic fit, possibly unique to medicine. I find an explanation, you might find it hard to believe, but uh, it looks like the best explanation. And the best explanation, when you haven't got the others, looks like the right one. I honestly believe that what Robert Taylor saw that morning on November the 9th, 1979, was as he depicted it. This dome-shaped object with a flange going around it, with cross-light projections on a flange. What that object was, I haven't a clue. Uh, at the end of the day, we treated this as an assault on Bob Taylor in the forest. Today we have been unable to uh, come up with any arrests, charge anybody with anything, and we are still, uh, the police, although I've retired now, the police are still, should be investigating this crime. You think the culprit may have flown? I think he might have flown somewhere. I don't really know. It's a thing that happens and uh, it was very mysterious. <laughs>